Good morning. Good morning. We're in First John chapter 3. Please stand for the reading of God's Word. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself, just as He is pure. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Well, we have been studying the book of 1 John, and we've been doing this as a church-wide Bible study, and so I've been trying to give you the, uh, the hundred-foot view, and then everybody else has been uh, meeting together and going through the, the intricacies of everything, and so uh, we've been having a great time, and, and, and I think that it's been beneficial to us. I know I've been challenged, uh, because as we looked, you know, the, the purpose of this book is that we may know is that we can make sure that we are followers of Jesus, that we are His. And so it's going to ask us some tough questions. It gives us some mirrors to look at ourselves and say, are we following the Lord like we ought to be following? And I don't know about you, but there's been a couple of times I'm going, oh, I need to work on that. And that's okay. That's a good thing. That's one of the things that, that we're meant to do is is none of us have got it perfect. We haven't figured it out yet. We're working on it. And it's something that we need to improve. And it's a wonderful thing when the Lord shows us, hey, this is something you need to work on. You know, I, I, there was a, a video uh, that I watched a, a while back ago. It's a couple of guys called the Skit Guys. And, and they were talking about, it's a skit called God's Chisel. And uh, they were talking about this guy says, I, you know, God, I want to be more like your son each and every day. And and they had a guy who was, who was uh, playing as, as God and was coming and he was chiseling away the difficult parts of our life. And it was a painful, hard process. But you know, one of the things is, is as we become more and more children of God, it, it, it cuts away the things that shouldn't be there. And we look more and more like Jesus each and every day. And I hope that's our, our goal. And, and it's worthwhile to us to try to be more like Jesus. That we can we can reflect a little bit more of His love and His joy each and every day. And so today we're going to be looking at, Are You a Child of God? is why I'm titling this sermon. So we're going to be in the, the last little paragraph of chapter 2 and then right into chapter 3. And so as we start, I, I want to give you, is that, I, I give you a funny $100 bill. Yeah, well, he has a mustache. <laughs> <laughs> now, now the thing thing of it is, is have you know? Do you know the the the, the government agency that is meant to look into uh, counterfeit bills, counterfeit money? It's it's one of the Secret Service's other job, okay? And uh, one of the things that they do is is they have people that work in the investigations branch, and they have them study the currency of the United States, but they don't have them look at funny money. They have them look at the real thing, and they have them study it, and they know, they know everything about it, to how the, the serial numbers on each bill work, to all the different little features, and everything that's about it. They, they, can, they, can, they know every little itty-bitty, teeny-tiny thing about the bills, and probably even some things that we don't know about them. And they look, and they, they continue to observe the right thing, so when something that is weird is placed in front of them, it's like, have you ever had one of those moments where it's like there's alarm bells going off in your head? Something's wrong here. Okay? I remember when I was a kid, we, uh, we came home from church one day, and uh, I, I walk up to the door, and the door just... Something is wrong here. You know, as soon as I pushed the door open, and I didn't have to unlock it. My dad said, Tim, get away from the door, and he went in first, and he checked it. Now, thankfully... I was silly, and I did not lock the door. And we lived in a safe town, and no one broke into our house. But there was something that, there was alarm bells that was going off. Something's not right here. And that's the same thing, is when we look at, we're going to be looking at what a child of God is meant to look like, and the things that a child of God should be doing. And so we are, you need to use it as a reflection. When we look at ourselves, are we doing these things? Is this who we are? Now, this is not to say 
that this is all about, you know, everybody's in here, so I don't look like that, so does that mean I'm... We're a work in progress. But, we should be able to look ourselves in. If we're struggling in some place, this is a place where we can say, Lord, I need help here. I need, I need to be better here. Or maybe if you're somebody who, who needs to take a look at your life and says, have I ever truly asked Him to forgive me of my sins? Have I ever made that decision? And so if you're someone here who the Lord is telling you, you've not done that, I pray that you will settle that today before we leave this place. So, what makes a fake Christian? Well, lots of things, to be truthful. You know, the fact of the matter is, is, is you can come to church. You can, you can actually be dressed in, in a suit and tie and look like you, you are a million bucks. You can have the biggest Bible in here. You can have, you know, all this. But the fact of the matter is, if you don't know Jesus, we're not, we're, you're, not, you're not a follower of His. You know, I, that was the thing that got me when I was a kid is, is you know, I'd I grown up and, and when I was a kid, you know, I had, all, I, I, I had good manners. I, you know, my mom and dad, my grandparents instilled in me, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, you know, all this sort of stuff, you know, all this. And for whatever reason, it was kind of a weird thing because not, not everybody had done that even when I was growing up. And so, you know, it, you know people would go to my grandma, your grandson's such a good boy and he does this and that and whatever. But you know, it was when I was about 10 years old that the pastor got up and says, it doesn't matter who your mom knows or your dad knows or who your grandparents know. Do you know Jesus? And boy, that hit me like a, a, a ton of bricks. Because I could tell you tons of stuff about Jesus. I could tell you all sorts of Bible stories. I could tell you how much He loved people. But I didn't know Him. And so that, that is, is the, the most important thing. And so it, you know, if you don't know Him as is Lord and Savior. If you haven't asked Him to forgive you of your sins, you might do all the Christian stuff, but just sort of like that, that Bill that had the mustache, you might not truly be a follower of His. And so, take a look at this. So we're going to start this morning in chapter 2, starting in verse 28. And we're going to go through 28 and 29 here real quick. It says, And now, little children... Abide in Him that when He appears, we might have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. If you know that He is righteous, you, are, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of Him. And so, it's talking about little children. So, once again, John is talking to Christians. He's calling us little children. You know, it's, it's, per, it's pretty appropriate title if you think about it. He was with Jesus from the very beginning. He's the guy who, who Jesus had instilled all this teaching in. And here's John. He's writing this in the, the latter portion of his life. And he's, he's saying, hey, abide in Him. So what does that mean for us? To abide in the Lord. You know, have you ever had... I, I, I'm going to tell a story that, that Veronica will find funny. You know... Veronica, unfortunately, is not my was not my first girlfriend, but she was one of the first of my girlfriends. But yeah, she was my first kiss. That is true. But here here's the deal: is we had an event that was at Seymour, and Seymour is very famous for one big festival they have. They have an Oktoberfest, and this one girl that I dated for a little while had done some really horrible things, and I broke up with her because well. I was not going to be a part of bad things. Um, and so what was funny is it was the, literally the first year after we got married, and so we'd only been married a few months, and we were sitting down, and the Oktoberfest was so full that we were sitting at picnic tables, but there was only onesies and twosies, okay? And so Veronica and I had to sit on opposite sides of the table, and I had this one young lady who came up and yelled my name across the way and came running up to me. And I was so dumbfounded. I was like, because uh, 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 I was like, who in the world? And then I thought about who it was. And so I was, I did not have a good relationship with this person. And so it was my previous, previous girlfriend. And she, you know, brought, everybody was saying, introduce your wife, introduce your I'm like, and it just, I was so dumbfounded. I was like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> And so they have a big laugh because I forgot to introduce my wife. I did introduce her. It only took me about four or five seconds, but I was just a little stunned. You know, this, the reason I tell you this story is, do you have a relationship like that with Jesus? 
you know him. You you've you've been involved with him a little bit, but you don't you haven't abided in that relationship. You don't you know he, he when he comes into your life, he seems as a stranger to you. You know that what John is writing, he's saying when Jesus comes back, if we abide in him, it's not going to be a scary thing. What in the world's going on? We're going to know. We're going to be ready. It's going to be oh, he's come back finally. Woohoo! Do you know how awesome that is? But for some people, their relationship with the Lord is, is so, it's going to be scary. It's going to be, what's going on? What's happening? I don't want to be in that situation. He's saying that we need to abide in Him. We need to have a continual relationship. You know, I hadn't, when she came up and she surprised me because I hadn't seen her in about two and a half, three years. You know, it was it was about three, two or three months after I broke up with her that I started dating Veronica. We we dated for two and a half years before we got married. You know, it'd been three years since I'd really done any, seen this girl or anything like that. I didn't have that relationship with her anymore. I couldn't recognize. You know, it just took me a moment. It's like this person knows me, but I don't know them. <laughs> do we want that? Do we want that situation when the Lord comes back? No, I don't think we do either. And so this is what he's saying. He's saying that we, we would not be ashamed before Him at His coming. If you know He is righteous, you know everyone who practices righteousness is born of Him. Are we doing Christ-like things in our life? Is that how we live our life? Is that what's going on? Or is our life not showing the Lord? This is important things that we need to think about because that goes right into chapter 3. Chapter 3, starting in verse 1, it says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed to us what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as He is pure. I love this first verse in chapter 3. Do you see the, the, the grammar point, the punctuation point at the end of that sentence? Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God! Exclamation mark. Are you excited to be a child of God today? Wow. You're hurting me here. Are you excited to be a child of God today? Okay, there we go. See, do you see the difference between a period and an exclamation mark? Okay, yes, this is exciting. We should be excited to be called children of God. Do you realize He did not just die to forgive us. He adopted us. He adopted us. Can you imagine? I mean... <laughs> There's a young man that Veronica and I got to know real well couple of them, in fact. It, it, it seems like when we were in youth ministry, we, we always had these, these uh, we always got to play aunt and uncle to these kids. And uh, one of them, when we were in uh, North Vernon, was a young boy who had a lot of problems, a lot of issues. He had a family that was kind of broken. And he was, man, this church loved this boy. And we loved him too. And I still am in communication with this kid to this day. And he's not a kid anymore. He's a grown man. But, you know, it is one of those things that when you just adopt somebody into your family, they're, they're, that, is, that is just something else to bring. And, and they, are, they are yours. You know, it, it, is, it is funny to this day. I, I won't hear from him for months or something, or, or he'll be very sprack, and then he'll just start talking to me. And it's like he's never left. And that, that's just such a wonderful thing to be, be a, a, adopted, to, be, in, to can be considered part of somebody's family. And God considers us His children because of what Jesus did on the cross. You know, if, if you've been treating your relationship to God as a get-out-of-hell-free card, please understand, this is not monopoly. This is not a game. This is life. And He, he, is, he had died so you could be Jesus died so you would be his brother or sister. 
You know, that's the thing that's amazing to me is when you look at how the family structure was when they were writing the Bible and they were talking about, you know, their family structure that they had was not the family structure that we have today necessarily. It was if in, in a family, the eldest brother got the biggest inheritance when, when, the, when the, the inheritance was passed on. But he had a job. And you go, well, see, it's best to be oldest and they get the most stuff. No, 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 no. He had a job to take care of his family. And he was to provide for his family. And that was the thing. is It wasn't just, oh, here's the stuff and you go do whatever. It's, here's the, the, the leader, leadership of the family. And so we are Jesus' younger brothers and sisters. He is to take care of us. That's the relationship that we have. When Paul is, and, and, and John and Peter are writing about being adopted and, and that sort of stuff, this is in a Roman context. Okay, this was the, the world power at the time. When you were adopted in a Roman family, you have more rights than a, a child that was born into that family. You could never be given up. You could never be disowned. If you were adopted, you were a child forever. Period. End of story. That is awesome. You know, that, that we are adopted into the family. We're called children of God. And it says, therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. When we look strange to the world, we shouldn't be surprised. If we look like the world and the world accepts us, we should be concerned. If the world doesn't look at us and say, you're weird. I hope that that goes, ooh, that didn't feel good. Because we need to be different. We're supposed to look like our Father. We're supposed to look like our older brother, in fact, that's what the whole thing of the Holy Spirit's work is, make us to more, be more and more like Jesus. Do you know how, how awesome that, when we look more and more like Him, the world goes, you're weird, we don't, I don't know. That's okay. That's a good thing. It says that we shouldn't be, you know, we shouldn't be surprised. But then it says, verse 2, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed to us what we shall be, but we know that when He reveals, is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. You know, I, I love what John is saying here. John does not understand everything about this, this glorified body that we're going to have. He's seen it. He saw Jesus. He, he's like, that's cool. He's not sure all about it, but he says we're going to be like him. And, that, and we see that time and time again. Pa Peter tells us that. John tells us that. Paul tells us that. They all agree. We will be like him. We will have a glorified body. We will be like Christ. That is awesome. Are you excited to have a body that doesn't have aches and pains? What about this? Are you excited to have a body that doesn't have those nagging temptations where you don't have this, this broken human spirit that lives in it? I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to that. I hope you are too. He says, we'll be like Him as He is. And He says, everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as He is pure. Now, do you see something here? This is, this is one of those things I want you to take a little hope in. He, he says He purifies Himself just as He is pure. He is in the process of purifying. Do you see that? It doesn't say we're to be pure. Yeah, we need to strive to be pure, but we're not there yet. You know, I love that song we just said. It says that fire will, will not feel it. it. It's to remove the dross that's within us. You know, when they purify gold, have you ever watched that? Have you ever watched when they melt ore down and all this sort of stuff? This, this gross stuff rises to the top and they have to skim it off. It's dross. It's the impurities. It comes off and you, you scoop it off and and the pure gold's there at the bottom. That's what we want to be. That's what it takes. Sometimes it takes that refiner's fire to, to get the impurities out of us so that we can be His children the way we're meant to be. So let's go on to verse 4 through 6. And this is, this is one of those things. That I, I want you to listen to this. I want you to hear it. But this is going to be hard. It says, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that He was manifested to take away our sins, and in Him there is no sin. Whoever abides in Him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither, neither seen Him nor known Him. Oof. 
This is a little hard, right? Because I don't know about you, but I can probably assuredly tell you I've sinned before I got to church this morning. I've probably done something I wasn't supposed to do. I may not remember it off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure it's there. What about you? Do you, do you, do you sin? So what does this mean? Well, one, it's talking about when we sin, we practice lawlessness. We're, we're breaking the rules. And this is just like Satan does. Satan, he, he broke the rules. He practices lawlessness. Jesus was manifesting. He, was, he came to take away our sins, and in Him there is no sin. It says, if we abide in Him, we do not sin. Hmm. We're supposed to abide in Him. And if we abide in Him, we're not... So what do we do with this? What do we do with this? What does it mean? Well, I think this, it means something very important for us. Is the fact that, remember, it talks about us being purified because He is pure. This is a process. We're still going to sin. But the problem is, or the thing of it is, is do we want to live in sin? Do we enjoy our sin? Are we excited about going, hey, I'm going to go sin today? Or is our heart, or, or, or is our heart match what, what Paul says? You know, I do the things I don't want to do. And the things I want to do, I, 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 I struggle to, you know, do we, are we there? Are we that, where that, that battle is there? When we do wrong, do we go, oh. You know, many of you know I struggle with anxiety issues. And when I let the anxiety get the best of me, I will, I will sit down sometimes and I, I will feel just disgusting. I'll be like, boy, I did, not, I did not come to You, Lord. I did not ask You to help me with this. I did not seek You when I was struggling. I feel like a dummy. Do you see the difference? The person who constantly wants to be in sin, they, just, they revel in it. It's just that, that is where they want to be. They want to wallow in the hog pit. They want to wallow in the filth. They want to be there. It's just, I'm excited for going. We need to be pure. We, we, we're, going to make, we're going to do wrong. We're going to sin. But this, we shouldn't be frequenting sin. This shouldn't be where we want to be. And so when we look at it, it's also a thing that whoever abides in Him does not sin. It's a process. We're still not there yet. You know, I think that this is something that we continue to work on and continue to strive for through our entire life. But this is the one thing that is such a beautiful promise is we will eventually be where, we, where we're not struggling anymore. It's not going to be a battle anymore. That's what that, that glorified body, when you don't have that, that sin nature that's constantly at war, when we're not fighting that battle 24-7 between what our, what our spirit and our, our body are constantly at war with each other. We're looking forward to that day. Continual sin causes us to lose focus on God. You know, when we, when we, have you ever had the pe person that's, that's kind of fallen away, that they've allowed the cares of the, the world and all that sort of stuff to, to pull them away from God? Boy, it, it just, we lose our focus. We lose, you know, we, we, we get seeing all the stuff and we get so concerned. We have this world that just keeps beating up on us and we just, we go, man, what, what in the world's going on? You know, when we, when we are just wallowing there in sin, the Lord doesn't want to keep us there. What does it, what does it say in other places in Scripture? It says that, that if we're His children, He's going to discipline us as children, right? You know, when my kids keep doing the same bad thing over and over again. I see a couple of them have their eyes on me. <laughs> There's some punishment that happens. In extreme situations. But we had a situation. My girls like to fight. Yeah, that is sisters, isn't it? And it's like, I, I'm not surprised by it, but I, till, I still tell them, kids don't fight. Well, Gracie and JoJo did, did one of those things that's like, I, I, I thankfully got through my childhood without doing, but it's one of those 
classic childhood faux pas that you know everybody talks about. Gracie and Jojo broke a window. They were fighting and they, they ended up knocking each other into it. Veronica fixed it. It's all good. But when I got home, they had to deal with Daddy because Daddy was not happy because they did what I told them not to do. You know, this is the thing. When we, when we are sinning, if we're continually in sin, we should expect the Lord to give us a spiritual whooping. Now, they didn't get a whooping. They got other punishment. But, yeah, yeah, they got no candy during Halloween. Ooh, that's bad. But, do you see what, what it is? We lose focus, but the Lord wants to, hey, bring you back. This is what it means to be a child of God. So what else here? Verse 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He, all, he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. You know, where's your heart? Where, where's your heart? What do you, what do you want to do? What, what, is, what is the core of who you want to be? I hope so. You know, this is the thing. is what, what, you know, Do you have a natural inclination to help people? And when you see people struggling, does your heart reach to them as, as the Lord has reached out to you? You know, this is this is what we should be checked. Or is it, oh my goodness, you know, look look at that person. You know, what we need to check ourselves. What what is what is our heart telling us? What are we doing? What are, what is what is the, the spirit telling us? Because if we have if we're children of God, we should have the Holy Spirit that is helping us to understand and we should be growing. So it says, Let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. You know. If you are doing things for, for the kingdom of God because, hey, it's things for the kingdom of God and it's not for you, you're not looking for the attaboys, you're not looking for the great jobs and all this sort of stuff. In fact, you don't care if anybody knows what you did or not. You just know you want to do the right thing because it's honoring the Lord. That's a good sign. That's a good sign. Be saying, he who sins is of the devil. You know, if, if you're there and you want to constantly destroy and tear down and stuff, you need to do a gut check. If your heart's on destruction, tearing down and making other people look bad so you look better, that's not, that's not where your heart should be. That should send some warning bells. You know, just like when you're looking at the mirror and you're looking at the thing saying, this is what a child of God should be. When, if you, that's where your heart is, is I look forward to tearing people down. I look forward to making people feel bad. You need to do a gut check. That's what this is for. Do you know Him? Are you sure? Make sure. Children of God and the children of the devil are pretty obvious. Verse 10. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was the wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. Man, he, he draws back to the second sin. Goes all the way back to Cain and Abel. We remember that story, right? Cain brought, you know, he, it was time to give an offering to God. And as he was walking, he goes by and he said, okay, I'll give him some corn and some bat." radishes and some beets and this, that, and whatever, and he brings this and tosses it on the altar, and, and God's not pleased. You know, Abel comes and he brings his best lamb. He kills the lamb and gives the best parts and puts that on the altar for God. And God accepts the offering and he says this. Why? Because it cost Abel something, right? It was an actual sacrifice. You know, Cain's, eh, whatever. You know, his heart was not in the right spot. He was not, you know, he didn't go into the pumpkin patch and say, Lord, here is my prized pumpkin. Here's the thing that I've grown all, you know, here it is. I, I, I want to give that to you. Or I want to give you, you know, 
probably should have asked his brother because they understood that it was death that, that covered sins. I mean, that was sort of demonstrated to them in the garden with Adam and Eve. I'm sure Adam and Eve told them about these things. But he didn't do that. And instead of, of accepting, you know, the thing of it is, is when you're criticized, when somebody tells you, hey, you didn't do this right, you have a couple of options. You can ignore it, you can accept it, or you can get mad about it. And he didn't ignore it. He certainly didn't accept it. He got mad about it. And it wasn't even getting mad at God. He, he didn't like, well, God, you should have accepted. I, you know, I, I'm the best farmer there is, and, and this, is the, this is the good stuff. I got you the premium crop here. No. He didn't get mad at God. He got mad at his brother. Why? Did his brother do anything to him? No. His offering was accepted because he was doing what was right. And so the, his brother got mad. He killed, he killed his brother. Can you imagine being so angry with somebody that you're, you're willing to kill them? Oh, yeah, maybe, maybe we do, maybe we do uh, uh, understand this story. I want you to think about that though. As we get to verse 13 through 15, it says, Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brethren abideth in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. You know, we need to understand what we keep talking about love, but what is the definition of love? Here's, here's two different types of love. We, we have people that think love is a feeling, right? How many times have you heard, I've fallen out of love with somebody? I just don't love them anymore. Love is not a feeling, people, it's an action. God's unconditional agape love, the love that we're, this is what it's talking about. This is the love He's saying we should have for our brothers and sisters in Christ is unconditional. Unconditional. It forgives. It blesses. It's self-sacrificing. It's everlasting. It is a love that's not for me. It's for, I, I care for you. Human love, that, that feeling love, it's conditional, it's unforgiving, it's takes, it's self-benefiting, it's temporal. It's all about, I love you as long as you can provide me with something. You know, I'll love you as my, what, you know, as my friend, my spouse, whatever, as long as you're bringing me benefit. That's human love. God love is, you love somebody because they're, they're a creation of God. You love them because God tells you to love them. You love them because you love them. That means they might frustrate you. They might make you mad. You know, my, 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 my sister, me and her fought just like my kids fight. And if you looked at us when, we were, when I was a teenager, when my, my sister was younger, um, you would say they, they would never care about... You know, my sister is one of my best friends. I miss when... when she, lives way, she lives way in the south of Indiana. So she lives not quite as far as we do from my parents, but they live a long way from my parents. And so it, it would be like a whole day long trip to go down to visit them. But it's always sad when, when I go to visit my mom and dad, my, my sister and, and my brother-in-law can't make it up to visit too. I always, I always, a little sad because it's like I always love when she comes up because it's, it's man, it's just like it used to be. You know, we, we like the same things. We do the same things. I, I remember when I was a teenager, I took her all over the place. You know, I had the license. I was the cool brother that took her to the movies and did stuff with her. You know, that, that was fun. But you know, the question is, is do, we, do we love one another? He says, we, we, if we, we have Jesus, we pass from death to life, but we also are exhibiting that love for the brother. And this is what he tells us. It's, it keeps coming back to love, 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 love. Why? Because it's different than the world. The world does not love. It wants to take. 16 and 17. By this we know love because He laid down His life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in needs and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? 
we should be there for each other. We should help them. Whether that's, you know, helping somebody who's hungry, whether that's, you know, helping somebody who's cold or whatever it is. If you see a brother or a sister in the Lord hurting and you have the ability to help, help them. Love them. Care for them. You know, we, we need to follow the example of Jesus. Do you Look at Jesus' life. How did He behave? How did He do things? You know, one of, the, one, of the, one of my favorite stories, I just told it with the Iwana kids, is, you know, he, he's in, he's in, uh, he's in uh, off the seashore and he's at Simon Peter's house. Simon Peter's mother-in-law is sick. She has a fever. And so he just got done at the synagogue and he cast out a demon and he preached and he'd done all this. And he gets home for Sunday dinner and, and the mother-in-law is, is sick and she's in bed. And so he goes in and heals her and she's feeling great. And so, you know, that's kind of amazing in its own right. Have you ever been like really sick and then you start feeling better? You don't like instantly feel better, but she, inst- you know, she was up. But when the sun went down and the Sabbath day was over, the entire town came out to see him. And so he started doing miracles and helping people, casting out demons, healing the sick, helping those that, that needed. And it says he did it all night. So he got up early in the morning, spent time with his father, went to the synagogue, did all that, spent all day. And the next morning, everybody was looking for him. And he got up the next morning and he was spending time with his father. And they, they said, oh, well, come back, come back. No, I've got to go. I, I've got to go tell other people. I've got to teach. I've got to preach. I've got to do what the Father wants me to do. You know, there's so many times that, that Jesus was tired or there was something. He understood what being tired was. But somebody would come to him, Lord, if you're willing. You know, I love the, the fact that the story of the, the leper who comes and he says, Lord, I know you can, you can heal me if you're willing. What did Jesus say to him? I'm willing. He reaches out and hears us. You know, it was forbidden. You could, if you touch somebody who was a leper, you would be unclean. Jesus touches the man, and instead of being unclean, he cleaned the man. That is awesome. Jesus is willing to touch the dirty to make them clean. That is awesome. Are we willing to follow his example? Because if we live a life that reflects Jesus, boy, that. That, that's going to call us to live a pretty different life. When we see somebody who's hurting, somebody that looks a little different than us, somebody maybe smells a little different than us, do we go, ooh? Or we go, I love you. 18 through 23. Finishing this up. My, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are, the tr- uh, we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before Him. For our heart condemns us. God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have a confidence towards God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do the things that are pleasing in His sight. And this is a commandment that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us commandments. Do you see, we, we find out what this commandment that he keeps talking about, we follow His commandments. It's that we love Jesus and we love each other. You know, there's a reason why Jesus, when they, they asked Him, you know, Master, what's the greatest of the commandments? He didn't tell Him one of the Ten Commandments, did He? He, can't, he had two. He boiled everything down. The law and the prophets into two commandments. He said, what was the first one? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. Love Him with everything you got. And the second is like this, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. Do we love our neighbor? Do you see? Love is an action. It's what we do for one another. When we're not happy with somebody, do it. Take care about them. Take care of them. Love them anyhow. Veronica, I'm sorry. I'm going to tell a story real quick. You know, here's the deal. Veronica doesn't get to come to service very often. (laughs) And she reminds me of things when she's sitting there. Every once in a while, Veronica annoys me. (laughs) But, here's the deal. Is I love my wife. And sometimes when I'm annoyed with my wife, and she's made me mad, I don't go, how can I get her back? I go, how can I make her day better? 
And I'll start doing the laundry, or I'll wash dishes, or I'll clean the house, or I'll do something. In fact, she prob- she knows when I pro- I'm probably a little upset because I start cleaning the house. I do the dishes. <laughs> Why? Because I love her. And so when I'm upset, I want to show love. When I don't feel love or at the moment, or I'm not happy at the moment, I want to do love. Do we do that with our brothers and sisters in Christ? Maybe they've, maybe they've upset you. Maybe they've done something. You're going, hmm. Do you, do you show love? Do you do it anyhow? Do you make it an action? You know, I'll give you this, this quote. This is from David Jeremiah. I, I, I really like this pastor. He's a good guy. He says, love's not a feeling. Love is a response. Love is an action. Are we going to follow the example of Jesus and make love an action? This is, this is the question we have. So let's, let's wrap this all up. I want to give you a quote from Mother Teresa. You know, every once in a while, Mother Teresa really figured it out. She says, there's only two ways. Either we love, and love and action is service, or we put hatred into action and destroy. You know, we've seen a tale of two people, right? We've seen a child of God or a child of the devil. Who are we? Do we put love into action and we, we serve and we care for each other? When our enemies attack us, that we show them kindness and we, it says we heap burning coals upon their head when we show them kindness after they've shown us evil? I always thought that was kind of funny. You really want to get their goat. Be kind to them. I love how, how the Lord works sometimes. But there's only two ways. There's only, there, we're only a child of, of the king or we're a child of the enemy. Who are you a child of? Look in the mirror. Now, we all probably look and we go, oh, I, I've got places I need. Don't understand. I'm not telling you if, you if you're not perfect, you're not there. But take a chance. Look. And if you're really struggling, ask the Lord, do, do I have it all figured out? Do I, do I know you? And if you do, and the Lord says yes, then help me, to be, help me be a better reflection of Christ. If not, now's the time. We're going to have an invitation. And if the Lord's telling you, you don't, you don't know Him, I want to give you an opportunity. I'm going to be standing up here. I want to make sure this is really clear. Because some people get confused. What is the invitation all about? I'm asking you to make a response. If the Lord is speaking to your heart right now, whether He's telling you, if, if you're, somebody says, you know, this is, the, this is the church where the Lord wants me. If you're not a member of this church, and the Lord says, hey, I want you to be here. I want you to come forward and let, let the body of believers know you want to be a part of this body. If you're somebody here who says, I don't know the Lord Jesus, I, I want to know, make a response. Come out. Let's pray. We'll, we're going to come down here. We're going to pray. We're going to make sure that you know the Lord before you leave this place. If you're struggling with something, something's bothering you, and you want to pray, lay it at the foot of the cross. Be willing to get up and come. You know, that's, that's what this is. It's, it's not, there's nothing magical about walking the aisle. But saying, I'm willing to make a response. I'm willing to take an action in response to what you've done for me, Lord. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to have a time of invitation. Whatever the Lord's speaking to you, I will be down here. The altar will be open. You can pray. You can pray right where you're at. I just ask, whatever the Lord's putting on your heart now, don't leave here the same. Make sure your, your, your heart is clean with Him. It's clear with Him before you leave this place. Let's pray and then we'll have an invitation. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for this. We thank You for John and his writing. And Lord, I pray that, that Lord, this is hard. Sometimes that when we have to take a look at ourselves, we don't measure up. I know I don't get this right all the time. Lord, there's sometimes I get frustrated and I don't do the right thing. I get mad. I get upset. I still struggle with anger. I still struggle with, with doing things I shouldn't be doing. And Lord, Help us to be more and more like You each and every day. Take the sin out of our heart. Take our brokenness, our weakness, and make it more and more like You. Lord, take the the broken pieces of our vessel and Lord, put Your goodness and glory in it that we can be fragile vessels, but Lord, You would work through us anyhow. Lord, help us to be the people You want us to be. Help us to reach this community for You. And Lord, if there's anyone here You're speaking to them today, 
Lord, let them come before you and get that settled before they leave this place. We thank you and praise you for it. In your holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. We would love to have you come and visit us at Calvary Baptist Church. We're located at 1808 I Street, LaPorte, Indiana. Service times are 9.30 a.m. for Sunday school, 10.30 a.m. for the main service. Or check us out on Facebook at CBC LaPorte.